Hi, how are you? Ben Atkinson here. I'm delighted to be with you. This is part three of our three-part teaching, uh, Out, What Do You, Meaning God, Think About My Neighbor? And how can we turn this around in prayer? Most specifically, we're in the Our Father. We're just going through the Our Father. We're learning how to pray. Again, this is Teach Us to Pray series from Luke 11, verse 1, where the disciples were provoked from watching Jesus' life. And as they were provoked, they said, teach us to pray. And then Jesus sat down and taught them to pray. It's so important for you to get discipled in prayer. It's so important for you to learn the Our Father. And then it's really important for you to teach the next generation. I'm going to show you how it is as important as the Ten Commandments, is as important as the Beatitudes. It's very, very important for us to understand today. Again, this is part three. First, it, uh, it's our fourth video because we did the intro. If you haven't done the intro, go back and do the intro. And then we have part one is where we learn to pray up. What does the scripture show me about who you, God, are? And then we learn to pray in. What does the scripture show me about what you think and feel? This is really, really important that we know this. And then out. What do you think about my neighbor? Or how then can I pray for my neighbor? So I'm going to pray and then let's jump in. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you prayed that prayer with me. And we're going to learn a little bit about God's heart behind our neighbor. And then we're going to learn how we can turn and personalize the Our Father. Here we're on sheet three. You can get these, you can download these from our website. We're going to take this, our Father, and we're going to personalize it, and we're going to turn it back around into prayer. I'm going to show you how to do that. So, before we jump right in, again, Jesus cautions us with two things. He cautions us when we're te he's teaching the Our Father, and Matthew records this first, that we're not supposed to have, do this with hypocrisy. And those were the Jewish leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees mostly, who would stand on the street corner and they would kind of just pray openly in such a way where they were being hip hypocrites. And that word hypocrisy, as we talked about earlier, is more of an actor with a mask on speaking through uh, um, in a way where their voice is amplified and they would have been pretending. And so Christ is saying, don't pretend. Don't stand on the corner and be demonstrative so everyone can see you. Then you've already got your reward. But learn to pray to our Father who's in secret. And it doesn't mean that we don't pray corporately. We do pray corporately. But the Lord is saying, you really have to have a heart position. You have to have a secret place with me. You have to be close to where I am. Get in that secret place with the Lord. Have a pure heart before the Lord and come in and pray to him. And from that place, our Father will reward us. He'll, he'll meet with us. He'll hear our prayers. We talked about uh, in 1 John, where John the, uh, the Beloved, 1 John 5, where he talks about when we pray the Father's will, we know that we he, he hears us. We know that he's going to act on our prayer. It's really important for us to understand. So we've gone through learning to pray up. That's where we asked, we took the Our Father in sheet one, and we asked him, what do you, who, what does the scripture show me about who you are? We want to get the knowledge of God. We want to get his heart, and we get that knowledge, and then we pray it back to him. We minister back to God. We say who he is back to him, and as we do that, he, his heart is moved, and then he's going to move our heart, and our heart is transformed with the knowledge of God, with truth. Next, we want to pray in. What does the scripture show me about what you think and feel about me? We want to find out who God is, the knowledge of God. 
We want to take the knowledge of God. We want to pray it. And then we want to put that truth in our heart. And we do that by finding out who he is and what he thinks and feels. And now we're going to jump in and we want to find his heart for our neighbor. So what does the Bible say <clears throat> about our neighbor? And I'm going to share with you a really exciting story of where I learned to pray for my neighbor. There's, there's so many different verses. We talked about last time in Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells a parable of a, the Good Samaritan and, and he talks about showing mercy uh, to their neighbor who was just like the Samaritan had showed mercy to the Jews. Again, that's combating racism. And so if you are a racist, if you think negatively about another group of people or you look down upon a people because of their ethnicity or their skin color and you speak or act derogatively towards them, then the Lord is saying, hey, you have to learn to love as Christ does. You must learn to love your neighbor. And so it's important that that in Luke 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan really does help us understand. And it actually sets up uh, Luke 11, where the disciples are learning to pray. And in the Our Father, of course, it's within the Our Father is the aspect of where he says, forgive our sins as we forgive those who sinned against them. And, and when you look at the Our Father, it's not only the Jewish people that sinned against each other, but the Samaritans would have sinned against Jewish people. And then from there, the nations would have sinned against Israel. So, so they're saying it's actually a prayer for them to understand that they're priests before the Lord. And Christ, of course, in Revelation chapter 1, it says, Jesus is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. He's the one who loved us and he washed us from his sins in his own blood and made us kings and priests to our God. And he's the only one who has the authority to do that. And so in essence, Jesus, when he's giving me our father and he's saying, pray this part, that we would forgive us of our sins so we can forgive others. And what it's saying is our desperate need for forgiveness and the Father's delight to give us that forgiveness, and the Father who has the power to forgive us. But in the same way, Israel had to learn to pray for their neighbors. In the same way, we, as standing as a priesthood today, have to learn to pray for our neighbors also. So really within the Our Father is a way to love our neighbor. Let's, let's also look in Exodus 20. Um, we want to look at the Ten Commandments. The, the, you know, let's just turn there. It's really important for you to know this. Um, um, Exodus 20, or you can go to Deuteronomy 5. Um, and so let's sneak over to Deuteronomy 5. And it says, verse 6, and we're going through this with my children. I want to instill this in my children. I want them to understand this. First of all, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. So well, for looking at that, what does the scripture tell me about who you are? He's the God who, who brought them out of Israel. He's their God, and he brought them out of Israel. Actually, when it says big L-O-R-D, -L it's meaning he's Yahweh, the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God who's on the throne who cannot be moved. And so, I mean, that's a, that's a big title, but in essence, what he's saying there is that's who I am, and I'm the one who brought you out of Israel. Egypt. Now, we know that God loves the Egyptian people. All through the Bible, he's, he's extending his mercy. And uh, uh, of course, Christ went to Egypt and was there. So we know that, and, and there's so many scriptures as we go through where Christ loves Egyptian people. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. And he goes on and on and on. And as you go through from verse 6 through 15, all of these parts of the Our Father, or I'm sorry, the Ten Commandments, they are actually upward towards God. And remember, we talked about this with Matthew 22, verse 37 through 39. The greatest commandment, Jesus asks a man, what's the greatest commandment? He says, he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 5. He says, love God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind. And in doing that, as he's quoting that, Christ says, and, and then he says this, the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. 
And it's important for us. That's why we do this up in and out again. We love God. The first commandment with, is we love him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the first of the commandments are actually about God. And so it's our interaction with God. It's how we love God, how we find out who he is, how we love God. So the first part of the Ten Commandments are loving God. The second part are of the Ten Commandments are how we interact with our neighbor. But remember, you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. So that's why in the in section, we, we want to find out what he thinks and feels about us so that what we can love our neighbor. So as you look, uh, as you look at this, verse 16 in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it's honor your father and mother that as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long as you dwell in the land where the Lord has given you. And so that first charge to the, the Israelites and to us is that we first love God or we have the first commandment first place. Second is we love our neighbor as ourselves, but we start within the family structure. Of course, that's why there's Malachi chapter four, verse five and six where God says, turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. At least I come and strike the land with a curse. Meaning that the parents have to understand that they must live godly and they, for, because of their relationship with God, it's important, and for the well-being of their children. In the same way, children honor God by honoring your parents. And then you'll be blessed, they'll be blessed, and that, that cyclical blessing will flow not only to Israel, but to the nation. So it's so powerful how we see it within the Ten Commandments, how we are to love God and then love our neighbor. We shouldn't murder. We shouldn't commit adultery. We shouldn't steal. We shouldn't bear false witness. We shouldn't covet our neighbors, uh, anything from our neighbors. So there you go. Okay, let's look at... Um, Let's look at Luke chapter 2, and this is one of my favorites. Not, uh, hopefully you have some favorite scriptures, but Luke chapter 2, it's, it's so amazing. And at first glance, you may miss this, but I want you to, I think we've talked about this in some of the other videos, that who was waiting for Jesus to be born? Of course, everyone was. But who is actually watching with their inside eyes or the eyes of their spirit? We know Simeon and Anna were because Luke records this. Of course, everybody wanted the Messiah to come, but most people just wanted a Messiah to come that would give them food, as we see when he feeds the 5,000, or they would make them rich and famous, or they would kick out Rome, or they would make Israel great again. And whatever they had this idea of kind of economic political and social prosperity for themselves. In fact, Christ was the opposite. And he's like, repent. And he's laying down his life that, that the Jewish people who were being oppressed by Rome would be so filled with the love of God that they would go back and preach the gospel to them. That's how he's asking them to love his neighbor. Of course, that's what he's alluding to and speaking to in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 to the end, which is the Beatitudes, when he's like, love your neighbor. And he's, he's talking about if they do something wrong to you, walk in more miles with them. And, and uh, 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 if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn the other cheek. And, and so you have to look at that, how Christ was teaching them to love their neighbor. And then within the Our Father, as we see who he is, we see how much he's forgiven us. Then we'll pray for our neighbor to be forgiven. Do you understand? When we see how much Christ is forgiving us, we'll say, forgive our neighbor. So even within the Lord's Prayer, we see all these aspects. And let's get back to Luke chapter 2. We see all these aspects within the Lord's Prayer of loving our neighbor. Let's get back to Luke 2. It's within, Simeon says this, he's waiting, the Bible says, for the consolation of Israel. Verse 29, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Again, he's staring at a baby. He's staring at Jesus. He knew it was Jesus. This is absolutely amazing. Uh, because why? Verse 26, the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not see death before the Lord Christ. And, and so he came by the Spirit to the temple. And his parents brought him in, in the child Jesus 
to do to him according to his customary of the law. So he would have had to come in and, and perform the, the rituals that were appointed by the law. Verse 28, he took him up in his arm and he blessed God. So here you see this man actually sees by the spirit, with the eyes of his spirit, what the word of God is saying. So he actually knew the times and seasons. So funny, my watch, I'll get up and pray in the evening when I'll get up early and I, I don't get to sleep much. And so my watch will tell me, it's supposed to be a smart watch. It'll say, you're, you know, you really need to get more sleep and this isn't good and you should kind of reconsider your life. And I go, okay, watch, you can tell the time, but you don't know the times and seasons. If you did, you would know it's time to be calling upon the name of the Lord for an increase of a spirit of revival to be in our land. You would understand the urgency of the hour over Gen Z, and you would understand through the scriptures what's happening now, specifically the book of Daniel, book of Revelation, book of Zechariah, Matthew 24. You would be contending. Of course, my watch just tells time. It doesn't know anything else. It's not very smart. Okay, it might be a smart watch, but it's not a wise watch. Amen. But Simeon, by the Spirit, knew the times and seasons, and he quotes this verse. It's so amazing. Lord, he prays his prayer, verse 29. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before, before the face of all peoples. I'll underline that. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Again, there's... When Jesus teaches the disciples to pray be our Father, to forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us, it's not only just Jewish people, but it's the nations. I'm going to prove that to you in a minute. It's the Samaritans. It's the nations. And so us, it's the family message, which is why the Our Father starts with Our Father. It's the family. It's the nations. Everyone coming together. And he says, you're to bring the revelation to the Gentiles. Simeon was an intercessor for the family of God to come together. And our prayer needs to be birthed in a place of you're our father. That very, those two words in the our father are the most powerful words. It destroys racism and brings people, the families of all the earth, all the ethnicities together. If you pray that every day, you got to get the heart of the Lord you have to understand it so with that being said and it will be and he says in verse 32 and the glory for your people Israel so it's important to understand Christ is calling us to pray for our neighbor both our physical neighbor both our wife our children our, our family members that we're having trouble with our literal neighbors and our enemies, and the people that don't look at us, and if you're a racist, the people that you're a racist against. So it's so important for you to lay down your life in intercession for the people around you. The Our Father shows us the way. Luke 18, look at this. <laughs> Boy, I just love Luke. When I get to heaven, I'm gonna give him a big hug. Luke 18, it's this mighty prayer for justice, verse one through eight. He speaks a parable to them, just as Jesus. Men, women, you're in there too, we always ought to pray and not lose heart. It's so important saying there in a certain city, a judge who did not fear. When it says men always ought to pray, put in the Our Father. Put in there them teach, being learned how, learning how to pray the Our Father. It's important for you to take that, know the heart of God, and keep praying it. You ought to pray and not lose heart. We could, we could write a book on that about how, you, how to be in a place of being watchful and praying and not losing heart. For there was a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. But there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me for my adversary. So this woman is in a place of frailty, but she's asking for justice. And he would not for a while. But afterwards, he said within himself, I don't fear God, I don't regard Man, yet this woman troubles me. I'm going to adventure her speedily. At least she weary me, weary me, weary me. The Lord said, hear what the unjust judge says. And shall not God avenge his own elect to cry out to him day and night, though he bears with them long? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So what does this mean? How does this fit in? 
we must be those people that stand, as Isaiah says, stand at the gate and call out for justice. Uh, uh, the writer of Proverbs says we've actually got to actually cry out for the for those who actually have no voice. It's important for us to stand and plead with the Lord for justice. We can't just, a lot of times we get so in, inward focused, we just kind of think about ourselves and our own ministry and our own ideas and what we want for us and kind of we'll be rich and famous and prosperous ourselves. But we, the Lord is saying, I want you to have my heart for your neighbor and cry out where there is injustice and seek the Lord for justice. We must be those people that are seeking for the preborn. That abortion is obliterated. That it, 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 it is completely gone. We've got to cry out for those that are appointed to die. We've got to cry out for, for, for single moms. We've got to cry out for those that are being oppressed. We have to cry out for the mentally ill that need to be healed. We must pray for our neighbor. We have to have empathy. We have to have deep Deep compassion, which you can only find in the heart of the Lord. And we got to cry out for justice where there is injustice. And um, we must be found praying for justice. So Luke 18 gives us an understanding. Um, and I'll say this. In, in, in Matthew 21, uh, we see in verse 13, we see when Jesus is making his triumphal entry, he comes back to Jerusalem. He comes into the temple and he does this thing that might seem awkward. He comes in and he flips over tables in this court. And what he was doing, he was actually in the court of the Gentiles. He was actually in what's called the outer court. That was the court of the Gentiles. So it would have been the, the one court for the priest, then for the Jewish men, then for the Jewish women, the next court. And that outer court would have been the Gentiles. It would be the only place that a Gentile could come and worship. So it was that line, it was that place that Christ goes in and flips over the tables. Why? Because he's our father and he wants the family to be together. And he quotes Isaiah 56, verse 6 and 7. And he says, my house, say that, my house, God's house will be a house of prayer for all nations. So in essence, he's interceding by flipping those tables out of the way and he's saying, for all the nations of the earth, I want you to be able to come to my house. In fact, we look at the parable. He does the parable of the wedding. He's, he's saying, I want everybody to come in. I want you to come in from the hedges, from the highways, from the byways. So it's important to know that Christ is interceding for the Jew and Gentile to be able to come together and worship together in Jerusalem. Of course, we see Paul. Paul completely... He sees Jesus on the road to Damascus. He's completely undone, and he gives his life to serving Gentiles. He couldn't do anything. He could have went back to Jerusalem and started to kind of make Jerusalem great movement and all that, but he didn't. He gave himself to the heart of the Lord. He gave himself. Of course, he writes Romans 15, verse 1 through 13. Really, verse 5 and 6, he talks about how God's bringing the families of the earth together. He lays down his life for the... For the people that didn't know Christ, for the Gentiles to come in. And of course, there, oh, I could go on and on and on. And, and, and uh, Romans 13, Paul writes, how we must honor those that are in authority over us. First Tim 2.2, 2, he talks about pray for the leaders that are over you. So it's so important for us to give ourselves, to put it for our neighbor. It's in Christ's part. Paul taught about that. It's the family of God coming together. So we've got a little bit about the Lord's heart. What I want you to do is I want you to grab the third sheet. Now the third sheet is where, again, we're praying out, what do you think about my neighbor? And what we want to do is we want to take the Lord's prayer and we're going to personalize it and we're going to go through it. Prayer sheet one is up. What does the scripture show me about who you God are? Prayer sheet two in what does the scripture show me about what you think and feel about me prayer sheet three is what do you think about my neighbor out up in and out and so it's important to know that all these go together remember we find the knowledge of who he is and and just like they do in heaven we want to minister to him we want to pray we want to turn that knowledge back around in words and song and we want to find out who he is and what he thinks about us and we turn that and we pray it back to him. And we put that truth in our heart. <clears throat> and then lastly, out, we want to stand 
and pray and decree and prophesy who, how much God, what God thinks about our neighbor. And then we need to pray for that until it happens. So I'm going to look at this prayer sheet number three. Again, we're personalizing the Lord's Prayer by getting revelation of what God thinks and feels about our neighbor. So again, I want you to go line by line through the Our Father. And I want you to look at it and say, how does this, Father, show me who you are, what you think and feel about me, and take that and what do you think about my neighbor? We're going to turn it back around in prayer. It's going to move the Lord's heart. It's going to move your heart. And it's going to actually be something that changes the people around you. Maybe it'll make you a missionary to the very people you're trying to pray for. And so, or maybe a generation. So we call, when we, when we ask God what he thinks and feels about our neighbor, we call this praying out. We pray out to others. Again, this is the second commandment where we're, uh, Matthew twenty two thirty nine, 39, where we love our neighbor as ourselves. So it's so important for us to understand that this is part of an, our action of loving our neighbor. Again, the, the, the Ten Commandments, they are outwardly, to, the first are up to God. The, the second part of them is to our neighbor, to our parents, to those around. Again, the Beatitudes are how we position ourselves before the Lord. The first is we must be poor in spirit. We must look at the Lord and be like, I need you. You are God. I have a holy fear of the Lord. You are the Holy One on the throne. Your name is hallowed above every other name. That's what it means to be poor in spirit, to position ourselves before the majesty and holiness of who God is and say, I need you. And we take our position. Unlike the devil who stood, was closest in proximity to the Lord, instead of in that position of being poor in spirit, he tried to elevate himself and then he started the Let's make my church down the street the better movement. That's what he did. He started his own movement down the street. So as we look at this, God loves you and you love God. You love yourself. Then we want to love others. And we do this first by finding out who he is and what he thinks then turning it around in prayer. A lot of times for our neighbor, we want to go do something. We want to say, I'm going to go out and I'm going to go paint my neighbor's house or I'm going to take my neighbor their things. And you should do that. You should go out and preach the gospel. You should go out and pray for the sick. You should go out and help people. But the Lord is saying, take the your father, get my heart and pray it and then be empowered and go out to do it. I hope, uh, uh, I hope that makes sense. Of course, this is Acts 2, if you have ears to hear and understand. So look at this example below here. I'm going to give you my example, but craft your own prayer. Pr again, pray the original words and then put yours in. Let me give you an example. I'm going to go through the Our Father, just four of mine. So first of all, you're our Father in heaven. And the example, I, as I went and text God about who he is, what he thinks and feels, I then felt him say that as I text him, as I talk to him, and he said, pray for your neighbor to know that I am their father. And that's, and you, you, you might say, well, well, of course, but when was the last time you prayed for your neighbor? When was the last time you prayed for your sibling that they would know God is our father, that he cares for them, that the weight of the heart of the Lord behind that, hallowed be your name. Let them know that they are a part of the family of God. That, as I text that, the Lord was like, pray for them, that they would know they're a part of the family of God. And then when I see them, I can talk to them. And I'm actually going to tell you a story about how I prayed for my neighbor. And then there was an act, a huge storm, and the Lord bro basically broke in and saved this man's home. And he knew it was the Lord. Okay, Your kingdom come. Let them know they are in your kingdom forever. It's so important for, for us to begin to pray that. We've got to pray that reality. Again, you craft it in your own way and turn it around in prayer. And then let your will be done. Father, let them know that you have a perfect will 
for their life. And, and I, I go through and I pray this for my unsaved family members. Every morning, my wife and I, we get together and first thing we do is we thank God. We pray up. We tell him who he is. We tell him how majestic he is. We minister to God like the four living creatures do. Then in, we pray that our hearts would be moved by who he is and his love. And then out, we pray for each other. I put my hands on my wife and I say, Lord, fill her with the first commandment, first place. I did this this morning. Fill her with the knowledge of God. And then she prays for me. And then we pray for our children after that. And then we begin to pray for our family members, all the family members on her side. And we, we name off the names of the family. Uh, you know, the Kubiks, the Smiths, the Mallory's, Atkinson's, I pray. It's the two from my, my side and the two from her side. Maybe you have extended, however, uh, uh, things have happened in your family. But pray for the different family members that are, are families that are represented. And then within all of that, then my wife and I, we take time to literally pray for our neighbors that are around us. We've seen so many amazing things from drug houses being cleaned to, to from those houses then being renovated and godly people moving in and miracles and signs and wonders happening in those. But one is my neighbor next door that I don't even know if he knew the Lord or not. And, and, and I prayed for him and prayed for him from the Lord's prayer and asked for an opportunity to preach the gospel to him. And I remember one day it, it happened. Uh, he needed some help. I came and talked to him and then he, he asked me, who are you? And I, I see, I get your mail sometime. You're actually some kind of religious person, you know? And he was swearing the whole time. It's kind of funny. I, I like him. I really like my neighbor. And, uh, and so with that being said, I got to talk to him about Jesus. But then I kept praying for him and praying for him. There was no kind of mass conversion or whatever. But I said, Lord, you know, the end times are coming. Like, you know, we're, I don't know when, but I mean, it's obviously increasing. And I said, Lord, as the pressures increase, I want to love my neighbor. Give me opportunity to love my neighbor. And the Lord said, in the midst of the storms that are coming from the Bible, he said, I want you to go out and serve your neighbor when catastrophe happens. That was his answer, what, what I need to do. So we had this crazy storm come through our neighborhood. And I went out and with my chainsaw and cut down trees and helped people and talk to, talk to people about Jesus and met people that I'd never met in seven years living there. And I was able to get into a bigger relationship with people as I did that. But my neighbor next door, what happened was this huge tree I'm talking I don't know maybe 16 feet around when you did put the, the circumference of it is what I believe he said 16 feet around this tree a huge oak tree started swaying in this storm and they were looking out the window the tree is uphill from them I want you to hear this and the tree instead of letting gravity take it down it literally fell uphill when was the last time you heard of a tree falling uphill? And so with that being said, I was sitting there staring, going, this is a miracle. And he said, oh, no, we know that, you know, someone was watching over us. He said, I go, no, this is, you have to understand that God spared you. And we talked about the Lord, him sparing. So super powerful, taking the Our Father, praying it, and then acting on the activities that the Lord gives you. Okay, what I want to do now is I want to try and I'm going to pray these prayer, my prayer, my our Father, what he thinks and feels, and I'm going to pray for my neighbor. And I would encourage you to really personalize this. I'm going to for, pray for my friend Deke. He's in a place where he really needs to know Christ. And so I'm going to pray for my uh, the power of God. He's in a really hard position. He needs a change in his life. So I'm going to personalize this with his name in it. Okay. Our Father in heaven, you are these Father. I ask that you would fill his love, his heart with your love, and show him that you are our Father. Hallowed be your name. Your name is holy above all others. I ask that you would show Dee that you love him and he's in the family and he has a place in the family. 
your kingdom come. It's your kingdom that will never be moved. Show D that you are the king who cares for him and loves him. Your will be done. You, our Father, have a perfect will above all others. Let your will be done in D's life right now. Break in and help him come. On earth as it is in heaven, Father, I ask for your perfect will, which is on in heaven to come for him, your plans, your purpose, you, Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father, listening, helping. Give him this day his daily bread. You are the one who provides daily bread. Give him your word. Speak to him by the power of your Holy Spirit as he reads the Bible. You forgive our debts. You've washed him clean as he said yes to you. Now God, sanctify him. Make him perfect. God, you said be perfect as I am. You told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. There's grace. Give him grace. Forgive those who's, who he's hurt and have hurt him. God, you're the only one who can bring mercy to wash him clean and grace to strengthen him. Help restore relationships. Do not lead us into temptation. You're the only one who keeps us from temptation. God, guard him. Don't lead him towards temptation. Turn him to your truth. You are the only one who can deliver us. Deliver us from the evil one. God, you are a deliverer. Deliver thee in the name of Jesus. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, your kingdom power and authority would come and touch these heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, let's prayer sheet one, two, and three. I want to encourage you to share this with a friend, practice this, fill these out, and pray them over as the Lord gives you grace. As you do this, I know your heart's going to be moved towards the Lord and towards other people, and you're going to see miracles, signs, and wonders around you. God bless.